Hi, this is John Ainsworth, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Hello, me one. Hello, me two. You excited about today's guest, me one? I sure am. I've got all my Battlestar Galactica questions ready to go, me two. BSG, me one? Uh, yes. Aren't we speaking with Ronald D. Moore today, me too? No. We're speaking to Roland Moore, author of this month's Big Finish Month release, Colony of Fear, me one. You mean, Big Finish haven't announced their new range of Battlestar Galactica box sets, me too? No. You know, I hear John Colshaw does a cracking lawn green, but no, not yet, me one. Well... Frack me for a cent on and a half, me too. So say we all, me one. G'day audiophiles, you are listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast devoted to Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name is Dwayne and joining me is... Philip. Hey everyone. Hey Dwayne. This time we're going to be talking about the Sixth Doctor monthly adventure, Colony of Fear, written by Roland Moore. We're going to have a bit of a chat with him later. Uh, But first of all, watch your step, Philip, because we're about to jump down that rabbit hole. Fantastic. Can't wait. Where are we going, Dwayne? Okay, well, where are we going? We're here. We're here. Welcome. Oh. Um, it, since um, uh, I've been mucking around with our YouTube channel, I've been uh, looking at a couple of other YouTube channels that are out there. I switched off a lot a couple of years back when um, the 13th Doctor started because there was so much hatred, so much vitriol out there that um, it, it just got too depressing for me. And I wanted to give the run a chance. And uh, I, I know you and I have spoken, and you know very well that I'm, I, I wasn't personally, this is not to say I share everyone's view, but I was not personally impressed with uh, the festive special that uh, we just had, Revolution of the Daleks. And it was kind of like the, it was like the last chance I'd given, I'd given the show before I, I sort of felt this real disconnect, a disconnect that I'd never felt before. So um, I've been looking around at some other YouTube channels, and of course you gravitate towards opinions that kind of suit yourself there's still a lot of there's still a lot of hatred out there which i don't really like but something interesting came up uh that's been talked about a lot uh, that russell t davies uh has spoken about doctor who and how it should be like marvel it should have these offshoot franchises uh very uh, different series a bit like what star wars is doing at the moment and um i just wanted to get your view on whether you think that is an option for for Doctor Who, uh, the TV series, going off on these different TV tangents. We did have that under Russell T Davies to a degree. It wasn't quite the same. If you look at someone like Star Wars, you you have uh, series that are sort of all aimed at the same audience, whereas RTD's series were were aimed at different age groups. Although I enjoyed all three of them: Doctor Who, Sarah Jane Adventures, and Torchwood. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts, Philip? Do you think it's possible for, for Doctor Who to go off on those tangents? Is the BBC set up to be able to afford to do something like this? I think the issue is more that, actually, every time Doctor Who has done a spin-off into a different area, it has been a success. So there was two Dalek films in the 60s, and both of them, uh, I think, add a lot to Doctor Who. Um, I think the Daleks movie and Invasion Earth, whatever it is, 20 whatever it is um are both great films they both were very successful the second one not financially rated as much as the first one so they didn't make a third which they had the option to but both those films have stood the test of time they're still great fun to watch 
Um, the spin-offs of both Sarah Jane Tortured um, were both huge successes. Class, not so much so. Um, but then that, that wasn't Russell T. That was someone else who did Class. Um, and I must admit, I didn't actually watch the whole thing. I watched the first couple of episodes and just decided... <laughs> How funny is that? I watched yeah. the I watched two episodes and I stopped. I I didn't like it <laughs> at all. Yeah, and so I've, I've not listened to the Big Finish stuff either for that reason. Because uh, yeah, I yeah, same here, same here. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, we're too similar, Dwayne. It scares me sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, and as a, I actually don't think Star Wars at the moment what we're seeing isn't for different audiences. Um, I think the Mandalorian is the same board. I, I think too many people take too many young kids to the films. So I don't think number two and number three are suitable. I haven't shown my 10-year-old them yet, though I know lots of people do, and that's that's their choice. But it, but um, certainly the first time I showed number three to my kids, they were a bit older. I think there was about, they were about 12, 13, 14, and I even skipped some sections. So I actually don't think Star Wars is for all ages. Um, I think it's you know, designed for 13, 14 and up. And I think so far what I've seen Mandalorian no, I, is... I, is... I, I didn't say it was designed for all ages. I said they were... My view of Star Wars at the moment is they're, they're aiming for all the same audiences, whereas mm. Russell T. Davies was aiming for different audiences. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, okay, I agree. I see what you're saying. And yes, you're probably right, actually. Um, I think... But now, but now Russell T. is saying that we should be doing something similar to the Marvel Universe. I'm, I'm not into Marvel myself, but I know there's all these different tangents that go off everywhere, all interconnected characters. Um Star Wars is doing the same thing, announcing all these different series. The The big buzz about Star Wars at the end of last year, of course, was the appearance of Luke Skywalker at the end of season two of The Spoilers. Mandalorian. That, yeah, well, I think if you haven't seen it... Bad luck. Uh, <laughs> tough luck. Um, it's all over the internet, so... Um, it is. You'd, no, you'd I agree. To... So I, it, that, I, that, I, was, I, that was huge, and, that was, uh, and that's what a lot of these critics of the Chibnall era in particular are saying, that... Star Wars uh, pandered to what the fans wanted at the end of The Mandalorian there. And, uh, uh, you know, because the, the same critics, the, the similar critics of the Star Trek um, series that are out there at the moment as well. So, um, yeah, yeah it, I, I just it, hope that Doctor Who could do something like that. Well, I think Big Finish has shown that they can because we have the Missy series, we have the War Master series, we have yep. the spin-offs happening. Mm. And they're embracing the characters, taking the characters even further, um, and and producing better stuff sometimes than the show was able to do. Oh, I would so, say not sometimes. Often, <laughs> often, <laughs> yeah. sometimes, always, uh, depending on the character. But I, yeah, yeah, I think I think we're seeing that it's obviously possible, but it would take lots of money, and I don't think the BBC is prepared to to spend that sort of money. And it's it's also. Doctor Who fans are used to the fact that it just goes on and on. So I think I think when Torchwood ended, I don't think Torchwood people have really given up, you know, got over the fact that it ended. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it was, there was complicated things in Russell T. Davis's personal life happening in terms of his partner, which is part of the reason why he didn't have the energy to put into pushing it further. Okay. But I mean, he, the fact he went to America to find the money was because the BBC just couldn't find the money for yeah. it. Um, which is all I taught. Ended. Sarah Jane, of course, you know, only ended because of the death of Elizabeth Sladen. And I think, but but Torchwood series four is a good example of um, too much American involvement because I I just did not connect with that series either. Once once Doctor Who, the Doctor Who universe leaves uh, British shores, it seems to lose something. And I, I did not enjoy Torchwood series four. Very much at all. Of course, you've got the main characters there, which are fantastic, but uh, it had that American tone to it that I just didn't, I didn't connect with. I didn't like it. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the series. I thought it was padded out too long. I mean, the entire second episode on a plane um, with very little happening, I, I, it just felt like, like there was lots of padding. And I think that's part of trying to save money and make things happen. Um but yeah, I, I think it had a lot of advantage things to it. But it was just, it was such a bleak concept. And I think sometimes Russell T could be a bit bit bleak and depressed. And that's, the whole series was very, very dark. But a fascinating concept. I mean, a brilliant concept to think about. That, mm. you know, what, what would happen if no one could die? And, and 
I don't think I'd ever thought through the consequences of how bad it would be for the world if everyone kept living and, and couldn't yep. die. Yeah. So I think probably if, if we're going to have those offshoot universes that, or offshoot story story arcs that um, Russell T Davies suggests, then the money's going to have to come from international backers. Yeah. And, one, and once you start involving more international backers, it changes the whole shape of how it looks. Mm. I, th- I think the reason why Doctor Who looks so good uh, it's because it's often just one or two people with a vision and then people who love it, making it work. But once you bring in lots of money from outsiders, then the interest is more in about making profit. And, 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 and you know, Mandalorian, it's, I mean, I love it, but it's about making profit. And you can see it's about the, the sales of the products and the et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 and that being said, though, they've found some pretty cheap way of technology to make things happen cheaply and well. Mm. Okay, the- well, that's uh, something for us to ponder and maybe discuss discuss again down the track. Um, so I think it might be time to get out of this rabbit hole. What do you think? Let's climb yeah. out. We'll uh, have a listen to a trailer for Colony of Fear and we'll come back with Roland Moore. Edwin, I'd like you to meet the scouting party from the rescue ship. We weren't expecting you for a few days. So I heard. Hello, I'm Mrs. Clark. And I'm the Doctor. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Colony of Fear. Doctor, help! Cease fire! I'm rarely pleased to see someone with a gun, but on this occasion, I'll make an exception. Who's that rather strange looking fellow? I'm afraid I don't know his name. He's smiling, but his eyes look sad. Wise. And behind him, that's... Oh! Yes, people are always shocked by the blue box. These creatures are intelligent, Governor. What makes you think they're so intelligent? Well, they have some kind of ability to psychically project their thoughts. How do you know? Because one of them spoke to me inside my head. I can't leave. If I go back to Earth, that's a long journey in cryo. What if he returns while I'm gone? And do you really think that's likely? It's all I've got. All right. Big finish. We love stories. One day he'll come back. I know it. And I'll be waiting. Our guest this time is the showrunner for the first science fiction TV show for for China, an adaptation of AMC's Humans, but most importantly for us. He's the writer of this month's Sixth Doctor Big Finish Adventure, Colony of Fear. Roland Moore, thanks for having a chat with us. Thanks for having me, Dwayne and Philip. Thank you. Well, I want to talk to you in a a few moments about you being a a showrunner and what that entails. But tell us, first of all, how did you become a writer in the first place? How long have you been doing it? Sure. Um, Probably about 20 years now, I think, um, professionally. Um, I started writing by putting on theatre shows. So I'd sort of use, um, write my own scripts and put them on on the London Fringe and the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, Normally sort of one person and a dog, you know, and um, but it's a great learning curve because especially writing things with humour in them, you'd sort of get instant reaction from the audience whether they'd laugh. And... um, so I did that for a few years and eventually sort of moved to TV, um, sort of working on children's TV, sort of animated cartoons. And uh, and about the same time, I started writing thrillers for like ITV and things um, that were developed and um, and never made. And that was like a, <laughs> a valuable learning curve of how TV, TV can work. Um, so, yeah, I'd sort of write children's TV and... Um, thrillers in parallel really so I had two sort of separate strands going um, I was always interested in sci-fi um, always wanted to write it there weren't that many opportunities to write sci-fi really um, especially sort of like in the uh, uh, mid 2000s um, there weren't that many UK shows that were um, sci-fi based until Doctor Who came back and then there was a bit of a resurgence um, so the opportunities of writing sci-fi were quite limited. Um, and so when I got sort of work for Big Finish, that was a fabulous sort of opportunity, um, not just to write sci-fi, but to write sci-fi for 
my favourite sort of show um, that I've ever seen. You know, it's a, it's a dream come so, true. So you've always been a fan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, there was no need for me to have a primer on it or saying, you know, which doctor's which or anything. Um, what era did you grow up in? Um, I was sort of late Tom Baker. Um, so he was my doctor. Um, and one of my favourite stories was always Robots of Death. Um, that was so one of the most amazing ones that I've always come back to. Um, so yeah, I grew up with Peter Davison as well, and um, I loved his portrayal. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just it's an amazing sort of experience that you can have different age groups, and they're all into different doctors as their favourite doctor. Um, and now you've got obviously young children who Jodie Whittaker is their doctor because they've known no other, and it's yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant the way it evolves. You've written a couple of stories for robots. Um, did you did you uh, just get offered them because they uh, knew it was your favourite show? Did you beg for them? How did, how did you get those? Um, I had to dress up as a Vok and um, hang around their offices for quite a long time before that happened. Um, yeah, I, I can't quite remember how they came about. Um, I think David Richardson, the producer, knew it was one of my favourite stories um, from the TV show. And... Uh, yeah, offered me one in the first box set, which I loved doing. I think also I'd done Humans for China by then. So I'd written all about AI. It was a 24-part series, so it was um, all about the world of AI robots, sort of realistic-looking androids that worked with us in our lives and obviously worked against us in some ways, otherwise there'd be no drama. Um and so I had that experience, so I, th- so I think that's probably why he asked me. Um, and so, yeah, it was a collision of two great things. I love doing it, um, love sort of investigating the world of AI. It's um, quite a lot of research done for those stories, you know, not just mine, but the whole set. So so tell us a bit about that. You, you were the, the showrunner for uh, Humans, an adaptation for China, uh, what what does that actually entail? Do you do you speak Chinese? Can you trans? Do, do you work in Chinese? How does how does that work? Sure. Um, unfortunately, I don't. I've I've tried to learn. I, I know a few words um, enough to get by, sort of asking for something and saying thank you. Um, but no, I don't speak Chinese. I don't speak Mandarin. Um, so yeah, the in the UK um, humans um, ran for three series. Um, and it was very popular, um, and so we got the 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 rights to do the first series. Um, so the only provisos really were that we had to start at the same place and end at the same place. Um, but instead of it being an eight part series, they then wanted a twenty four part series for China. So it was a chance to really expand it, expand the story, explore different facets of it and um, really go into depth. Um, So we had different sort of strands, different stories of the week, um, all exploring AI, all exploring that sort of, um, that world and what happens when it goes wrong. Um, So the characters were vaguely the same as the UK series. Um, Everyone loves writing Nishka, who's the um, (laughs) really violent, anti-human robot. Um, We... Yeah, and and as it worked as a showrunner, it meant that um, I hired a team of writers to write it. Um, so I wrote six episodes myself, hired six other writers um, in the UK to write the other episodes. Um, and that process all, all happened over Zoom and Skype. Um, and there was a Chinese writer's room as well. So the scripts, when we'd finished our drafts of the scripts, um, they would then be translated into Mandarin and worked on by Chinese writers um, because of of certain things about tone and um, uh, just sort of living in China that perhaps we wouldn't have got, so they were added. um, So they added their past to it. Um, But the the whole thing came about really because... um, drama especially bbc drama is so popular in china um but although it's popular they have to watch it with subtitles because it's obviously not in in mandarin um so our basic brief was to produce a show that had the same high quality values as like a bbc drama or channel 4 drama but 
was actually written in Mandarin for the audience. Um, so yeah, uh, and it was the first sci-fi show ever because um, China hasn't really done sci-fi. Um, <clears throat> the the big turning point for them was they a Chinese author won the Hugo Award for a sci-fi novel in about 2015, um, the Three Body Problem, and um, and that sort of opened their interest, thinking, yeah, China is is good at sci-fi, and uh, we want to do more of this. Um, so yeah, it's the first TV show ever that's a sci-fi show for them, um, and it was due to be shown um, last year, but I think it's going to be shown this year just because of uh, the epidemic and everything. It's um, it sort of changed their sort of viewing patterns and what they wanted for the time being, but it's all ready to go. Very good. That's very exciting. Um, a, a TV series that you um, that you wrote about twelve years ago now, uh, Land Girls. Tell us about that because it kind of when I when I was reading about it, it kind of made me think of another series that Big Finish is actually doing. But how did how did Land Girls come about? Sure. Um... Land Girls was yeah my first sort of series I'd done as as a creator, um, so I'd written for other people's shows, um, and one of those shows we have a, a medical drama in the UK called Doctors, um, which is a daily daytime drama, um, and it's a it's a fantastic show because it deals with a sort of uh, doctor's practice, um, not time lord doctors, um, but you know regular doctors, um, and each episode has a self contained story. Um, so it's a great series to dip in and out of, um, and they can tell every sort of story. You know, I've, I've written horror stories for them, sci- even sci-fi. Um, and from you, that, you, you've, you've done about fifty episodes of that. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's um, well, it's a great show. I mean, you can do screwball comedies, you can <laughs> do family dramas, um, horror, anything. It's it's such an adaptable format. Um, so you get your guest cast for the episode that you you invent all that, have a beginning, middle and end. It's, yeah, a fabulous show. Um, it's like a gem of British TV that's sort of buried away, really, on daytime. Um, but from that, the they, um, the controllers of the BBC wanted a, a wartime drama that commemorated the start of the war. And so they asked loads of writers to pitch for it. Um, and I, I pitched Land Girls, which um, centred on the on the women's land army, which were a group of well, about eighty thousand women who worked on the land in Britain, um, making uh, making sort of produce crops and things, so that we didn't starve. Because being an island, we we couldn't get things in because U-boats were stopping uh, supplies coming in. Um, so these women literally helped us survive. Um, and so the drama I wanted to tell was about a group of those women because it was a time of extraordinary change because uh, you had women from all different backgrounds suddenly slung together doing work they've never done before, forced to live together under the spectre of war. Um, and I thought, well, this is a great idea for a drama. It's been done as a comedy show um, and a film, but it had never been done as a drama. Um, and so I pitched it. I also thought it'd be very cheap to make because it's all people in fields, you know. Um, didn't turn out that way because obviously you do need a lot of interiors, a lot of period dressing and things. Um, and so, yeah, it was great. It was a real female-centric series. Um, I had one rule for the series what, that was the the female characters must never be saved by a man. Um, I, just, I thought that would under, undermine their, what they did in the war. Um, so I made that sort of simple change um, yeah and um, the uh, Atta Girl which Big Finish did is um, a similar sort of female fronted drama um, which flips back and forward through time as well um, which was something I considered for Land Girls bef- before um, was telling a sort of story in the present day as well as one in in the past but um, for me, I couldn't quite get it to work. But I think uh, when Atta Girl, um, Louise Jameson and Helen Goldwyn, um, they worked out a really clever way of doing it. Um, 
which sort of re- relied on this sort of huge mystery of what happened to this air woman. Um, but yeah, the Atta girls were equally as vital to the war effort as the land girls. Um, there's sort of certain similarities, I guess, between the two dramas. Um, uh, and I think it's sort of gone down very well with listeners, uh, Atta girl. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of Philip's favourites, isn't it? It is. We uh, we chatted with Louise Jamison about it recently too, so got all of her perspective and as writer and director and performer. Yeah, it's a real passion project for her, I think, and uh, it really shows. Um, but yeah, the, the mystery of Daphne, I think, hooks you in from episode one. You want to know what happened to her, and uh, it's uh, yeah, be- beautifully told. And I love the way it just flips around in terms of different periods in the war to tell different stories. So, so how did you find yourself working for Big Finish? I think my uh, my agent pitched me to them, um, and so sort of I sent in a trial script of something else I'd written, um, and then I was asked to pitch ideas for the early adventures. So, because um, the first thing I wrote for them was uh, the Night Witches for the Second Doctor. Um, and so I was asked to pitch ideas for the second Doctor, Ben and Polly. And I came up with about four ideas. Um, I think three of them were pretty good. Um, one of them was Night Witches. Um, the fourth idea I realised was basically a Star Trek idea that I'd subconsciously taken into my mind and thought was my own. So <laughs> not surprising that one was turned down. Um, but Night Witches was the one they wanted me to do. Um, and it was a pure historical um, and that was really good fun because, again, it was that period of the war, Second World War, that I'd done Land Girls. So I knew a lot about that world. Um, I didn't know a lot about the Night Witches, but obviously I researched that and found out, again, an amazing group of women who um, repelled the Germans with basically crop dusting planes and farm planes and homemade bombs. Um, incredibly dangerous, flying at night with no no lights, no radar, nothing. Um, and yet they'd sort of fly eight or nine missions a night. Um, so I really enjoyed writing the historical, um, which was something, something as a Doctor Who fan, I never thought, I never imagined myself doing because um, I always liked the sci-fi shows more than the historicals. Um, but when I came to write one, I realised how well it could work and it made me reevaluate everything in terms of the classic series that, are, you know, like the Aztecs, which I always thought was a brilliant series anyway. But I watched them with fresh eyes after that, and it was it was great to sort of reevaluate them all and, um, and realise, yeah, you don't need a monster, not always. Oh, I hope we ain't back in the South Pole. Uh, no, 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 no. But, but I told you we need our warm clothes, didn't I? Ha, you see, I've been to Russia before. Well, this Winter Palace is well named, I'll give you that. It's brass monkeys out here. Aye, I'm freezing. The snow's turning my knees blue. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, The Early Adventures. The Night Witches. There's something you should see. Uh, what is it? If this is 1782, they didn't have tanks then, did they, Doctor? Oh, my word. There must be a dozen of them. Armoured cars, too, I... I can't quite make out the markings. Me neither. But I know that shape. Blimey! They're German panzer tanks! <laughs> Stay down. Gonna blow up the TARDIS. Get down! <laughs> the pilot's a woman. In 30 minutes, if you do not tell me what is going on, I will shoot one of your comrades dead. Hold on tight, Jamie. Hurry, Doctor. She's coming around for another go. Big finish. We love stories. Oh, I don't like the sound of night witches, Doctor. What's the difference in writing for TV as opposed to audio? Um, it's probably something to do with budget, I think. Because um, when I was writing uh, The Night Witches... I realised I had like biplanes, fighting panzer tanks, vast hordes of Germans in the snow, 
um, explosions on sort of munitions dumps. Um, any one of those would probably cost me my budget for a TV show. You know, it's uh, <laughs> so it's it's totally that you can do anything on audio. Um, you can have massive armies, space battles, exploding planets, um, and it's a lot cheaper because it's all in person's head. Um, and I think you know. Special mentions must go to the sound engineers at Big Finish because some of the directions we writers give them are incredibly hard to <laughs> to do. And I know I know a few writers um, will write some really tricksy ones that they then nail. You know, it's amazing. I really appreciated how you used Polly in the Night Witches. I think uh, often she was underserved in the TV series, but you actually made her a very strong. It was following the idea that not need to be rescued all the time by men. Um, yeah, I thought it was, I think Annika Wills played that role really well and strongly. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it, that, that performance stood out for me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think she enjoyed doing it. And um, I mean, it was lovely to spend two days in the studio with her and the rest of the cast. And um, yeah, she's a lovely, amazing woman. Um, but yeah, she's totally up for Polly being expanded upon as she, from the TV series, um, and she really appreciates, I think, when when writers give her that opportunity. Um, and there's, there's been some lovely Polly stories for Big Finish, um, and uh, yeah, and it was lovely for Night, which is to centre around her and um, and that sort of uh, go for that sort of um, enemy of the world feel with it as well. What's it like being a writer in studio? I'm, I'm not sure with, with Doctors and other shows. As a writer, do you often go in when it's recording, or obviously you spend two days with Big Finish? Is that a normal thing? Um, yeah, Big Finish are great because they always, before the pandemic, obviously they always invite the writers along for the two days or however long it takes. Um, and yeah, you know, since the pandemic, we're we're still invited, which is fabulous. But it's it's all done remotely now um, at the moment. Um, but for TV, yeah, you get normally get asked to come along if you want to, to stand around on set. And it's, um, on TV, it's quite a frustrating process. I found, I found it quite stressful because you've basically done all your work and you're just sort of standing around while they're setting up a lighting shot or something and it takes ages and and you think there's no way you can improve on what you've done already because um, you haven't got that opportunity to, to do any more with it. So it's quite stressful. So you end up making tea and coffee for everyone and trying to sort of busy yourself but yeah I find it quite um odd being on tv sets um and I think the first time I ever went to doctors they asked me if I wanted to be an extra in it um just sitting in the waiting room reading a paper and I, th- I was so tempted but then I thought I'm going to be the guy who just stares straight at the camera you know and just uh, <laughs> I just can't do that <laughs> so yeah never appeared um you've not written as many scripts as uh, quite a few of the writers for for Big Finish, uh, but hopefully as time progresses, that'll that you, your your output will be more and more. But you've you've had quite a broad exposure to different ranges. You've you've got a Space nineteen ninety nine coming up. You've done Steed and Mrs Peel, Robots, Survivors. Uh, I think you did Star Cops as well. Um, so one one thing that Philip and I really uh, enjoyed, and and we talked about this, we had Jane Slaven recently, and we were we were talking to her about uh, transference. So uh, that was a an interesting way that that was written because it was one story uh, set over eight episodes, but uh, with four writers, each of you had two. Um, so how did you find that process working with uh, with three other writers? And I think Shadow of the Daleks was another one where you would have had to have known the outcome of what was happening. That was only released a few months ago. Um, how, how, do you, how do you like writing with that group of writers? Is that similar to how it works with TV, with a group of writers? Yeah, it's quite similar, actually, especially for transference, because um, we could all get together. We went to a couple of sort of lengthy pub meetings um, we're all drinking coffee to just sort of stay focused. Um, but yeah, it's, a, <laughs> <laughs> it's all professional, obviously. Um, and yeah, so we had a couple of long meetings where we'd sort of thrash out the story. Um, we knew from David Richardson whose idea it was, where where he wanted it to go. Um, and yeah, I'm incredibly proud of Transference. I think for eight hours of drama, it's a twisting, turning tale that always wrong foots you. 
And I think uh, Warren Brown and um, Alex Kingston are just incredible in it. And uh, the chemistry is great. And um, yeah, you're just never sure where you are with him. And um, so, yeah, I think the, the way it worked was we'd pitch our individual ideas for the stories of the week, really, I guess. Um, where they're loosely sort of like I wrote one that was set in a seaside cafe um, and it's so you pitch your ideas we agree whether it all worked um, and yeah it was like a brilliant game of consequences you know where you sort of leave the, the next person with a cliffhanger and they have to resolve it um, well as what because I think you wrote you wrote episode three and four is that right um yeah, maybe five and six, I think. So, what, what was it? What was it like being handed characters that you then decided to kill off, or did you all decide together who you were going to murder? Um, I think we knew when they all had to die. Um, <laughs> so, I felt really sorry for Robbie, who was a character I created for my episode, who's this lovely, laid-back cafe owner, and it's just, yeah, poor guy. I mean, yeah, I hope people have listened. <laughs> hope people have listened to this before they listen to this um, podcast, but. Um, yeah, I felt really sorry, and especially um, Delroy Atkinson's performance. It sort of it really brought it home to me. I thought, God, I'm really mean doing this. <laughs> and um, yeah, and Shadow of the Daleks was a similar thing where it was. Um, we knew where it was going. We knew what the reveal was, how it all fitted together, and then it was just basically given the chance to play, write a half hour play, any environment. The one proviso being the Doctor's got to be in it. It's got to have those three characters, or those three actors, um, playing whatever characters you wanted. Um, so it's fabulous fun. It's really good. Um, and John Dorney had written a, a draft of his finale quite early on, so we knew exactly how it, how it played out and the reveal. Um, and I think it was a lot of fun for listeners because everyone was trying to work out yeah, how how can this be? How can he keep meeting the same people, but they don't remember him, and they're they're all different people? We're we're wondering what the heck was going on, <laughs> but it it was a magnificent payoff at the end. It's one of my favourite releases of of the year after after we got to the end, and it, it all paid off beautifully. Yeah, and I think it's quite chilling when you when you realise the exact nature of it, and it's quite heartbreaking and. Um, hmm. Yeah. Typical John Dorney style. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's marvellous. He's um yeah, constantly inventive, um, trying new things and, and they always work. It's brilliant. Let's move on to this month's release that we're that we're focusing on, Colony of Fear. It's um it's the the last uh monthly release uh, featuring the Sixth Doctor, did that uh, weigh heavily on your shoulder? Or did you know that at the time, or you weren't sure where the scheduling was when you wrote it? I don't think I quite knew it at the time. I think as I probably got to about the second or third draft, I probably realised. Um, and luckily, most of the sort of anxiety had gone by that point because you know when you stare at the blank page, that's when you're you're most worried about what you're doing. I think. Um, but yeah, it was obviously I wanted to give them a proper send off um before the sort of box set adventures start and everything um well it's just been it's just been officially announced this week that the six doctor and constance are getting a box set uh later this year oh, that's right isn't it phil um did you did you know about that at the at the time that you were writing this um no i didn't know so that was a lovely surprise and i'm not surprised that they've got that because i think the the duo works so well together. Um, she's a great companion for him. Um, they're both incredible actors, and um, I'm, you know, I think I'm, I'm obviously not the first person to say this, but I think the way Colin Baker has blossomed on audio in a way that perhaps he wasn't allowed to on TV because of all various manner of things. Um, good stories, good stories, and emotional range for him as well, which um, you know. There's, I'm a I'm a big fan of Time Lash actually because I think it gives it it gives him a lot of different things to do, um, and you can see he just totally rises to it when he's got a script that does that. And obviously there are problems in Time Lash beyond that, but 
Well, not long after that, we had Mysterious Planet too, which uh, for me is probably probably one of my favourite TV serials because it, it gives that character development that, that particularly us as Big Finish listeners, we love characters and you really got that between the Doctor and, and Perry and Mysterious Planet. So for that reason, it's it's probably one of my favourites. So No, I love that one too. Um, and yeah. yeah, I think um, you know, Terror of the Vervoids I love as well because it's it does lots of clever things with Agatha Christie. Again, gives him Colin different things to do. Um, but no, I mean he's yeah he's incredible um, on audio and um, just the range of what he can do. So you re- you really write for that, especially as I I'd written one before, so I knew where we could go with it and take it to the yeah, limit for sure. Um, in the extras, I noticed um, John Ainsworth has said that. After he directed Memories of a Tyrant, um, he suggested that you pitch again. Um, so this is this is John Ainsworth's doing, is it? On his recommendation? Uh, yeah, he asked me to do this one, and um, it was sort of a script that came from an idea that changed quite a bit. Um, so it was always about the um, the emotional dilemma of it. That was always there. Um, the giant insects were not there at the start um, and I think I said on the ex- extras that originally it was about a, a virus that was decimating this planet um, and we just when we came to actually write the scripts we thought no, nobody wants to hear about that now that's uh, <laughs> very, very topical <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. no it's, it's it it's an interesting story because um, well it, it, interesting that it, it, it sort of goes in two different directions it's got the base under siege element but it also deals with um, another aspect which is really difficult to talk about if uh, if we don't want to spoil it because um, but it is interesting that I noted that this one deals with aspects of memory as well as your previous story dealt with memory is memory something that you've got an interest in <laughs> um, yes it's well spotted um, yep they both do um I think um, I've always been interested in memory and the fallibility of it, um, and so I think both stories, both memory of memories of a tyrant and colony of fear, explore different aspects of memory. Um, again, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, so sometimes it's what you can, can remember and you're hiding, and other times it's what you can't remember at all, um, and it's fascinating to play with that. I think. Um, and I think especially with the Doctor as a character, he's had this longevity where you think he's lived so many days. How can you possibly remember everything? And it's that... Um, I love I love stories where, you know, he can't remember something or it's at the sort of tip of his sort of consciousness and he can't quite get there. Um, and several stories have done that. Um, so, yeah, it's something I want to explore more um, and hopefully from a different angle. What's, we, we don't we don't give spoilers, but um, so I'm talking about how to phrase the question carefully. You, you do set up some stuff in terms of memory in the Doctor. Is there is there future plans to take that somewhere, or is it just? I mean, it's interesting with the end, coming to the end of the monthly range. Is it going to just hang there, or or is there actually plans to take what you left and, and take it somewhere? Um, I mean, it certainly could go somewhere else. Um, and a lot of. A lot of reviews have commented that they think it's like the setup for something in in its own way. Um, yeah, I don't know to be honest at this stage. Um, so, 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 it's not something you were asked to put in as a setup. It's just something that you deliberately just left hanging. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I wanted the audience also to make their own assumptions about what what they'd heard, um, but hopefully in a satisfying way. It's not like there are vast unanswered questions. I think. It's just, yeah, what period does this relate to? And, um, yeah, again, it's quite hard to talk about, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's very hard because it, it's virtually half the half the story. Yeah, quite a few people have had different theories about the un, sort of unsaid bits of it. And um, it's fascinating to sort of see where people think, oh, it's, it's from this or that or it references this. Um, and obviously the bits that I think, oh, that's really clever, I, I'll probably say yeah yeah that's what i was thinking yes. 
I was reading one review this evening that said that you were you were obviously trying to take elements from the the current TV series, but the BBC wouldn't allow it, so you changed it and put this bit in. So um, I thought, oh, I wonder if I wonder if that's true. But anyway, good theories, good theories. We'll never know. I like that theory. Yeah. <laughs> so do, do you, do you have a thing against bugs and insects? Um, I think a natural f- sort of fear of them, I guess, just on a surface level. Um, but yeah, they I think also I wanted them to be quite malevolent, and um, uh, I like I like stories where the sort of the villain of the piece, if you like, goes for it. You know, they're they're trying to kill people. It's not there's no messing around. Um, there's no they don't espouse their plan or say what they're up to really. Um, they just do what they do. Um, but yeah, it's probably influenced by lots of summer days when wasps have followed me around the garden and things and thinking, yeah, what if that could put me in a coma? <laughs> have you ever been to Australia? Because we've got more things that can kill you out here than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> in the world. Oh, I'd never be stuck for ideas out here. No, <laughs> they're probably the same size as the, the wasps in the Colony of Fear. But now I've heard of some of your incredible wildlife and uh, yeah, haven't been there yet. Just one question that 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 really stood out to me when I was listening. Um, we we were talking just recently on another episode, hasn't gone out yet actually, but um, we were talking about the importance of of cliffhangers, and uh, and how they work in TV and how they work in audio. Um, I noticed the cliffhangers, partic- particularly the cliffhangers for episode one and two. Normally, normally, you have a cliffhanger that makes you think, oh, well, how are we going to get out of this one? Whereas you had me for these two cliffhangers thinking, what is it that they have to get out of? So I was sort of more anticipating the cliffhanger that I wanted to hear more about in the, in the next episode. Were you doing that on purpose? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I love cliffhangers. Um, it's one of the best things about writing Doctor Who. It's just that, yeah, getting into an impossible corner. And then, uh, um, yeah, I think the first cliffhanger I wanted to, um, I guess, misdirect people in a way. Because um, the doctor knows what it is, um, and and I thought, oh, people people who are fans of old enemies are going to think, oh, it's so and so, um, and so it's purposeful misdirection. Um, I apologise if that upset anybody. Um, I wasn't upset, but it had me thinking, thinking, oh, who's this going to be? <laughs> yeah, um, and I think purposefully my description of the creature was designed for that as well to think. Oh, yeah, this is something we've seen before. Um, but yeah, I think um, when you write a really good cliffhanger, you're you're so proud of it, and you think it's such a lovely sort of thing to lead up to. Um, I also like stories that give you the cliffhanger, and then the next episode doesn't follow it up immediately. I think that's quite a nice technique that um, we see quite a lot in Big Finish sometimes. Um, that's really nice, I think, because then it obviously gives you the dramatic tension of thinking, well, I want to see what happened there. And, um, and I think with, with a story like this, um, or any, any Doctor Who story really, um, the advantage of splitting up the companion and the Doctor is, lends itself to this sort of dual storytelling where you can sort of leave each scene, hopefully, at a mini cliffhanger before following up the next person's sort of strand. Um, but yeah, it's all about cliffhangers. Fabulous. You were saying originally when you wrote the story, it was a virus that escaped rather than giant bugs. So when did, when did you ch- make the changeover from the virus to the bugs? I can't remember exactly when I did that. Um, I think I was looking for a different angle once we decided the virus wasn't a good idea. Um, and... I mean, it was still a base under siege story, really. Essentially, the same things happened, but it was just this sort of malevolent, intelligent virus. Um, so, yeah, I can't quite remember when I changed it, but um, but once the wasp idea was 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 there, it really worked, I think. And the fact they've got this sort of telepathy between them, and um, Misha Malcolm, who plays the Hive, is. Yeah, you know, I love what they've done with her voice, and uh, it's quite, quite scary. I think, um, and yeah, a great performance. There was no, uh, I guess, part of what I was kind of expecting was some sort of moral question in terms of the right to destroy a whole life form, 
Um, which is when you said it was a virus, we've got no issues with killing off viruses because we don't consider them life forms. But these these bugs were more than that. Was there any was there any dilemma in terms of their right to live and survive? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's some some in the story there where, especially when the doctor's on the, the ship with all the specimens on it, and he's saying how rare they all are and how. I mean, he, he admonishes the colonists for killing something that's very rare. Um, and I think, I mean, he only decides on dealing with the, the bugs in the way he does because of the greater threat that they pose to sort of humanity. Yeah, um, yeah. And he knows that it's not like they're the only group of that, that insect, you know. So we can do a sequel sometime. Yeah, there's 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 those moments of aliens too in there where the tension and the threat and everything. I was thinking, yeah, there's yeah, I've I felt moments of aliens too in there. Oh, I'm glad you got that because yeah, that's my intention. Um, yeah, I love the always love the idea of marines versus monsters. It's always great. Um, uh, yeah, and um, there were originally the insects were going to lay eggs in the colonists, and we decided that was way too horrific um so the, the, the body hor- the, the, the body horror was already pretty high in sorts of i mean i mean doctor who does do body horror and i have no issues with with this but it was already pretty <laughs> it's great and i think also when you when it's audio it's somehow much more intimate because it's your relationship it's a one-to-one relationship with what you're listening to um straight into your ears um and so everything has much more of a visceral effect i think so you've got yeah even swearing or um, any sort of horror, it's just so much more I- intimate and in your in your head. It's just, yeah. So I think you have to rein back sometimes to think, yeah, if I did this in a film, that would be fine. But if on audio, it might be too much. So um, uh, all in all, Colony of Fear, excellent release. Um, uh, you should be very proud of yourself. Uh, we, uh, we, we enjoyed it. And we're looking forward to, to to much, much more output from you over the months and years to come. Thanks for Colony of Fear. Philip? I just want to ask about um, Space 1999. So as, as a kid growing up, it was one of my uh, favourite shows. Um, not, as, not as much as Doctor Who, but it was up there in terms of every episode. And we had it on in Australia every morning at 6am for several years. So I used to get up ridiculously early to watch it every day. So, you know, went round and round. So I saw the episodes lots and lots of times. Now, I know that Big Finch is doing some original stories and some adapted from the TV series. And I noticed that you're doing an adapted story. I think it's The Dragon's Domain. Is that correct? I think Death's Other Dominion. I knew one of the, two, one of the famous ones, Death's Other Dominion. So, so, so how did you end up getting an adaption? And you know, how, how do you go about the process of doing an adaption? Yeah, sure. Um I mean, strangely enough, I'd been watching Space 1999 again. Um, I got the box set of it and was just going through the episodes um, when David Richardson said to me, did I want to write one? Um, And I think fairly, uh, very early on, I was offered the chance of doing this adaptation um, of this classic episode that um, it's, it's a remarkable episode. I mean, it's got Brian Blessed in it, but he's he's giving this nuanced, subtle performance that um is a great bit of casting actually because they've gone against type really you know we're used to the sort of bombastic um performances he does um but he's got this quite subtle like, nuance like, thing like when he comes back for the next season <laughs> <laughs> and um and yeah and john shrapnel who plays the sort of the the crazy character is given what you think would be the brian blessed part in it um and it's a remarkable sort of um, hour of drama because so much happens in it. There's so many ideas stuffed in there. Immortality, the right to reproduce, um, finding a, another human colony. Um, there's so many ideas in there. It's all godhood, everything. Um, and so adapting it was quite a big job, really, because I had to obviously watch this, the show a lot more times to get every sort of beat of the story and then you realize that some of those beats aren't sort of properly perhaps ended um so there's certain strands of the story that seem a bit strange when you 
start really analysing it. Um, so part of my job was to sort of make it all work as a coherent thing um, and also sort of bringing sort of the new slant we were doing with Space 1999 to it. Um, so, and, and Nick Briggs was fantastically helpful with that because he helped me with the script in terms of direction and um, and sort of concentrating on various strands of it. Because, um, yeah, it's brimming with ideas and it's just... There's almost too many ideas for an hour. Well, Breakaway was an amazing success, um, so I'm really looking forward to this new box set coming out. And um, yeah, and and yeah, yeah, Death of Dominion is a brilliant episode. I'm fascinated to see how it how it goes. I've got a question about Space 1999. Well, we know Mark Bonner uh, is is in the lead role. Um, he's also playing the Eleven whatever other characters, every time I turn on the TV, is there, is there anything Mark Bonner can't do? Yeah, I don't think so. I think he's, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty amazing, isn't he? Um, mm. And I love what Nick Briggs has done with the characters from, from Space 1999. They're, they're recognisably the ones we know, but they, you know, especially in the case of Helena Russell, you know, she's been given a sort of um, slightly more less, gumption. <laughs> less, less dull. Yes, <laughs> I mean the, the 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 best Helen Russell. There's a um, big finish episode, uh, Bang Bang a Boom, which is a takeoff of Deep Space Nine and Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, which has a Helen Russell character who just the whole the Doctor just walks around saying, "I just feel so helpless," and <laughs> it's, it's it's just a total parody of what they did with Helen Russell. So it's, it's good to see that you know big finish have actually given her more gumption, and a bit more um, says. I remember reading the script for Breakaway and thinking there's a bit when she sort of uh, calls someone an asshole when you think, <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> Barbara Bain never got to do that. But uh, and I was always fascinated with the title sequence for Space 1999 and thinking, how do they rotate round her? As a kid, I didn't sort of think she's sort of a statue there and she's rotating. And yeah, it's quite fascinating how they rotated the characters in the title sequence. Do you know how they did? How did they do it? I don't know. I presume. I presume it was a camera moving round them, wasn't it? Or either that. Or... Standing, standing on a standing on a lazy Susan and being t- twisted. Yeah, we have to find out because it's one of those things. It's got to be one or the other, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then came the title sequence for series two. Yes. Yeah. Totally different. <laughs> and the also the sort of decision to sort of basically put all the what happens in the episode in the title sequence was a bit. Odd, I think um, I used to close my eyes at that point because I thought I don't want to spoil it. And uh... you've um, done a number of Survivors episodes too. Um, I was thinking that they're all very bleak. Um, the episodes you did, but very character driven. Um, how, how did you get? To, how did you end up doing the, the Survivors? Is that another show you watched when you were young? Um, no, I'd never seen it, but I, I watched. Um, I watched all the box sets. Um, probably about 10 years ago, I guess. Um, so I'd never seen it at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly dark series. It's, um, but it's sort of tinged with human hope, hopefully. Um, and I think the sort of the, I think totally the big finished range managed to capture what they did on TV in terms of that tone and darkness. Um, but yeah, some of the things that in my episodes, particularly that, I just thought I can't ever imagine writing this for TV because they wouldn't let me do it. Um, and kudos to Big Finish, they let you go there. They let you take it like Abby to a really dark place where she's digging up a grave, you know, and uh, incredibly dark stuff. But hopefully, you know, character driven and um, good drama. Um, no, it's incredibly good fun to write that series. Um, the temptation, though, to put in some reference to a blue box appearing, and you think, yeah, you could do a crossover here of a Terry Nation's other series, you know, and um, the temptation was very huge, but we never went down that route. I think one of the things that stood out to me in terms of your writing is the diversity of styles. So lots of big Finnish writers, we sort of, and this is unfair to do sometimes, but you can sort of say you kind of know what to expect from certain writers. Whereas looking through what you've done for Big Finish so far, you've done the totally bleak with Survivors, 
but then you swing that against the Avengers, which is just hilarious. And finally, you've done the historicals, you've done crime fiction, you've done the robots, and, and you introduced both box sets, one and two. You did the first story in both, so you were sort of your, it was your job to kick off what was going on. You've done countermeasures. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see the diversity, that, and even looking at the colony today, which was, you know, Aliens 2 or Starship Troopers. Um, you, you, your, your diversity is huge. Is, do you think part of that, as you see with Doctors, because that, that was a huge range of storytelling, did you just like telling different stories every time? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a really good question. I think, um, yeah, I think part of being a, part of the thing I find exciting as a writer is, giving like you're giving a different brief for a different show and having to hit that tone hit that um what they're going for and to make what you're doing part of a whole um and i really enjoy that process of thinking yeah this is an avengers episode so it's going to be this this and this or this is a a, a doctor who episode it's going to be this this and this and obviously there's a big range in doctor who itself but um so whatever era you're writing for it it's like um with the night witches i tried to use language that was used at the time of the black and white series you know um so you try and fit in everything you're doing um and obviously it's a bit of a cheat in a way because you're bringing emotion and things that perhaps is more um more akin to the new series into sort of older doctor who and things but it works and it's marrying the two for a, for a constant tone. Um, but now I love that part of the process. I love getting the brief right. Um, yeah, it's re- really part of the fun. Roland, I just wanted to ask you, uh, seeing as you're a Doctor Who fan, I'm, I'm only assuming that you've followed the Big Finish monthly range throughout the years. Uh, have, you, have you done that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the first one I listened to was um, the Genocide Machine, I think. Um, I haven't listened That's to all. On. Yeah, I haven't listened to all of them, um, but I'm slowly sort of working my way back, um, especially with all the sales and things. You know, just sort of um, picking up releases I've not come across before. Um, and it started off just like cherry picking stories that I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting, or it's got the Ice Warriors in it, or something. Or you know, um, has there been any standouts for you over the last? 20 years or so because with it coming to an end where we're like we're wanting to get some feedback from uh, as many people as we can about some of the standout moments in the monthly range and what it might have meant to you over the years um well i mean there's so many stories again it's it's doctor who but you can tell any any sort of story um and yeah picking a highlight is really hard i mean uh, a recent one i really enjoyed was uh, scorched earth um, by Chris Chapman I thought that was incredibly good um, I also think you know what he did there in terms of the emotional um, sort of standoff between two, two the two companions was incredible um, and a really sort of visceral piece of work um, um, I really like Robophobia um, again robots I think that was their f- might have been their first appearance um, in in Big Finish, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been so many um, that I can't quite remember off the top of my head now. <laughs> uh, oh, I listened to um, what did I listen to the other day? Ish, which I thought was really interesting. I'd not, um, I thought it was a really clever idea, all about language and how this malevolent word could be used. Um, and again, you think that's part of Doctor Who in the same way the Ice Warriors are, you know, but totally different. They've been totally different stories. I think all the actors used by Big Finish are amazing. Um, the, like, I was really pleased to have Leighton Pugh in my Colony of Fear because he did a a river song where he was this evil scientist. And it was just such a brilliant performance. You just think, wow. Well, um, really appreciate you having a chat with us, Roland. It's um, It's been... Uh... A privilege, as always, to chat with uh, one of the writers of, uh, of Big Finish. So thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, for saying, staying up late for me. That's brilliant. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Our no, pleasure. It's wonderful talking to you. Lot, lit a lot. Thank you for that. Um, one thing we like to do, one thing we like to ask of, uh, of all our guests is, 
whether they can provide a recommendation of something that you've been listening to. So it could be anything. It could be music, could be uh, audio drama, uh, an audio book, anything that you've been listening to lately that, um, that you could possibly recommend. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been listening to a podcast um, that I found really funny. Um, it's called Heavy Pencil. And um, it's basically conversations, very clever, neat little idea. It's conversations between a, an actor and his agent's assistant's assistant. Um, so he's quite low down the sort of pecking order in this agency. So he only ever speaks to the assistant's assistant. Um, and it's their conversations, just as phone conversations. And he's quite a pompous, old school actor who's... Um, who he yeah he obviously thinks he's a lot more famous than he is um but it's a fabulous series it's very funny and um it's uh it's written by uh tony gardner um and uh yeah it's well worth a listen um also recently i've listened to um uh, baffle gab did a production of um the hellbound heart which the clive barker story um as an audio play i think it came out a few years ago and um and that was pretty chilling i was listening to that in the daytime and it was still sort of making me look behind me it's uh <laughs> yeah quite creepy um yeah and uh for big finish i've been listening to the torchwood range um the monthly range i got rather obsessed with those um trying to catch all the stories um again it appeals to that sort of dark edge of of writing i think um yeah, and um, it's brilliant what sort of James Goss and the other writers that David Llewellyn has done with um, with that series. Um, so yeah, they take it to some really dark places. So that's my yeah, uh, thanks. My happy spring listening. <laughs> thanks very much for those recommendations and for for spending all your time with us this evening. Thanks a lot, Dwayne. Thanks, Philip. That was a lovely chat we had with uh, Roland Moore fantastic stuff um let's talk about our recommendations i think it's your turn to go first this time philip oh it's always since it's always been my time to go first but okay. it's always your turn <laughs> um yeah so i would recommend a podcast um i think i've mentioned before my musical theater enjoyment uh, in fact i was just watching a musical with my kids before i came on here um yeah so i want to recommend it's called putting it together by, it's a Stephen Sondheim podcast. It's by a Canadian guy, um, and he's working through every Stephen Sondheim musical in order, one song at a time. So it's a mammoth task, because Stephen Sondheim has written a lot of songs, and uh, at the moment they're starting to work through a little night music. Um, so we, we're moving into the musicals. The first, the first, we start off with Gypsy and West Side Story, which I, both I love. Um, then we had a couple of musicals I didn't really know very well, but we're now moving into the, the more famous ones. But if you're into musical theatre and you want a strong an analysis, song, song by song, its history, its words, why it's come together, um, it's very um, detailed. But if that's for you, it's a great podcast. Fantastic. What about you, Dwayne? What are you listening to? What about me? All right, well... You know, I've got a history with with radio, and and one of my loves in radio. You're talking about your musical loves. I'm talking about mine. Um, is uh, progressive rock. So I used to go seeking out independent artists because it's quite a quite a niche genre. Well, it was back when I was in radio in the in the noughties. and so I used to seek out artists. And one day I was looking at a, at a prog website that listed a whole heap of artists and I wanted to find the most interesting names of bands that I could find that I'd never heard of. And I, I picked up, I, I just found the CD next to me and I, I uh, thought I'd recommend that. This is a band called King Bathmat, one word, King Bathmat. And I thought that is such an interesting name for a band. I'm going to get that, see what it sounds like. And I absolutely loved it. I got to um to interview uh well it's, it's actually a project it's i think he, he did put a band together to tour with but um it's one of these projects where he put the band together for touring but then produce all the music himself in his bedroom type thing um but yeah really really good stuff really hardcore rock 
more of the more of the hard progressive rock, not less symphonic, more hard. Um, so the the out the album I'm looking at right now is called Truth Button. So I'll put a a link to that in the show notes. It's still available for download. Um, the guy behind the project, John Bassett, does a few other projects as well. One's called Arcade Messiah, which is an instrumental project. But King Bathmat actually has vocals in the lyrics as well. So um, I would recommend you uh, have a listen to King Bathmat. I'm just going to say it one more time because I love saying it. King Bathmat. There you go. That's my recommendation. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, so uh, next time on The Sirens of Audio, we uh, have a, a great chat lined up for you. We are going to be... Oh, you talk about it, Philip. You talk about it. I'm guessing we're talking about Nev Fountain, are we? Good guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're recording these all out of order, so my mind's everywhere at the moment. But yeah, next time we have uh, the amazing Nev Fountain. Uh, he's written heaps and heaps of different shows for Big Finish. He's also done uh, other bits and pieces we talk we're going to talk to him about his big finish work we're going to talk to him about uh script editor's death comes to time we're going to talk a bit about him about some of his novels um all up a fascinating chat about a lot of things mm, really really good stuff um you're going to enjoy that one and particularly for those big finish listeners who sort of gave up years ago and only listened to the first few years he wrote omega uh, which is still available to listen to on Spotify. And he also wrote The Kingmaker, which is also a favourite uh, of Big Finish listeners from that first 100. So, um, and he talks uh, in depth on Omega and The Kingmaker as well. So make sure you come back for that. It's going to be great. So until then, ta-ta. What about you, Philip? I was happy with just the ta-ta. That was for music. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, going to, are you going to take us out with a Sondheim number? Uh, no, I don't do that. I care, I care about our listeners too much for that. Okay, all right. <laughs> See you next time, Philip. Bye. See you, everyone. You have been listening to The Sirens of Audio, episode 43, in conversation with Roland Moore, with Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Husky by the Geek. Find him on YouTube. His video version of the theme is fantastic. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcatcher. Watch the Sirens of Audio on YouTube. Just search for us there. Write to us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Check our webpage at sirensofaudio.com. Our Twitter handle is at Audio Sirens. Find us on Facebook by typing the Sirens of Audio into the search bar. And if you want a bigger buzz than any coma-inducing alien bug lifeform can induce... Keep listening to audio drama because audio drama raw!